So my talk is titled, Preserving User-Defined Expression Through Dimensionality Reduction. To, um, I, I was struck that it also could be called, to summarize or paraphrase Lauren from yesterday, new control strategies for an aging electronic music instrument. I also perform on my laptop and with electronics and have been performing on uh, pretty much the same instrument for many years. And I'm now looking on, uh, for more ways to control that instrument while I'm improvising. And to also take another quote, another thing I'm trying to do is to quote Owen, uh, the sweet spots are all, all, are all over the place. They're not contiguous, are they? So this is another thing I'm trying to do, is find the sweet spots and use them. So to state the goal very clearly with this project I'm uh, doing is I want to take sound generators of some kind that have a high dimension of control inputs, find expressively meaningful combinations of input settings, and then intelligently organize those combinations into fewer dimensions to control the instrument, uh, specifically using unsupervised learning, which I have some thoughts about I'll, why I put that there that maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to later. This project also has this sort of hypothesis which is that doing dimensionality reduction like this can enhance my musical expression by enabling quick, interpolated, and gestural movements through high dimensional spaces. So the laptop instrument that I perform on has many buttons, sliders, knobs, all that stuff. I want to be able to move through all that space more quickly uh, and more gesturally. So the reason why this is, I was talking about this with Sam earlier, and we mentioned it to Rod, and so the reason why I think unsupervised learning strategies uh, are more useful here is that they'll create lower dimensional, they'll create more useful and therefore expressive and meaningful lower dimensional spaces than supervised strategies. If you use a supervised strategy, such as the Wekinator or a neural network where uh, we saw Michael training different positions, that then get mapped to different sounds. This requires me to know the structure of the high dimensional space that I'm working in, and it requires me to also know the structure of the low dimensional space that I want to map it to ahead of time. And I don't know what those spaces look like or what they are, and I'm just not really sure. So for me to determine ahead of time how I want those spaces to relate to each other there's a lot of assumption that goes into that. And so I'm trying to think of ways that I can not make those assumptions and let the computer make some of those, figure some of that out for me, and then I'll learn how to perform this instrument. Uh, I just want to quote or cite one work here, because this, I think, know many of you know this paper, uh, Fasciani and Weiss from a number of years ago. The thing that they did, which was similar, but they were trying to create an instrument that had the widest possible sonic exploration. I'm not actually trying to do that. I'm trying to find just the sweet spots that I like and then map just those into a lower dimensional space for me. And also, they assume a deterministic behavior so that the same synthesis parameters will always produce the same audio, the same audio descriptors. So uh, and there's no stochastic elements at all in the synthesis algorithm. I actually have a lot of stochasticity in the performance patch that I work with, so I have to sort of remove this, um, remove this assumption. Okay, so the system that I'm building looks like this. Uh, this is what Super Collider looks like, for those of you, yeah. Um, and so this is a synth that's uh, sort of a cross synthesis feedback frequency modulation thing. And this is my machine learning mapper that I'm building and working on. And what we see here are these outputs mapped to these sliders. So decimate one, bit crush one, decimate two. They go down all the way. And when I play this instrument, I might have this attached to some MIDI controllers or something, and I'm performing. All these sliders are wiggling, and the sounds are changing, and all these sliders are wiggling along with it. If I find a sound that I like, oh, uh, yeah, Whoosh. there they are. Oh, also, I, so th before I perform with this, I take the sound sonic output of this, and I take this audio bus and drag it into here so that, this, so that this ML mapper is aware of what all the parameters are and also is aware of what the sound is that's coming out of the synthesizer itself. 
And then while performing, I wiggle a bunch of sliders and find a sound. Cool, I like it right there. And then I hit this add to set button, which means add to the training set. Then I wiggle it some more, find another sound that I like, add it to the training set. And what this is doing is it's saving both the audio descriptors that it's hearing at that given time, and it's also saving the parameter settings that it's set to at that given time. So I get these pairs. Parameter vector, audio descriptor vector. And once I get enough of these, I perform on this data set. I perform on the audio description vectors, an algorithm called the TSNE, which is short for T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Uh, it's a dimensionality reduction algorithm. And what, it, what this, what dimensionality reduction algorithms do is it takes the vectors that are in a high dimensional space, which in this case might be, I think it's 12, but also I've been working with 18, 20, 25. And it'll uh, embed them into a lower dimensional space. And first we'll see two uh, dimensions so that the vectors that are close to each other in the high dimensional space will end up close to each other in the low dimensional space. And the vectors that are far away from each other in the high dimensional space will end up far away from each other in the low dimensional space. In order to do this, I had to port uh, this algorithm from a JavaScript version I found into Super Collider so that I won't have to bounce back and forth between different things. And then once I run this algorithm, it gives me something that looks like this. So these are all these data points in, in a high dimensional space. These might be you know, anywhere from 10 to 25 dimensions. And it maps them into two dimensions so that vectors that are close to each other in high dimensional space will end up close to each other here. Things that are far apart will end up far apart. And now I have the audio descriptors from high dimensional space mapped down into a lower dimensional two, two, two dimensional space. The next thing I do is I use this algorithm called the Monkreis algorithm, which is, for those who are interested, an optimal solution to the linear assignment problem. And the way this works is I say, OK, I'm glad you all are organized like this. Things that are similar are close to each other. Things that are dissimilar are far apart. But now what I actually want is not to have you in this sort of fingered space. I want to have you on a grid. So I say, here's a grid. Now I want all of you to find the spot that you're closest to and move to that grid spot. <clears throat> so it's sort of this gridification algorithm. And the reason that I want to have this is because there they all, all are moved. You can sort of see, oops, you can sort of see the, um, you know, the way they move. This is the same before and after of the algorithms. You see that the yellows are still close to each other, the pinks are sort of moved, the blues, etc. Uh, okay, so once I have this mapping, then what I do is I can interpolate through this space. So I can move around in two dimensions, and then wherever I am in two dimensions, just look at what neighbors are there, and then do a um, weighted average uh, Euclidean interpolation between its neighbors and get whatever vector it would be the interpolation between these four points. Or if I'm in a higher dimensional space, it would be between eight points or whatever the dimensionality is. This is a little video of the algorithm sort of running in full. So when I press it, we'll see uh, the algorithm starts, and the TSNE is sort of, move, sort of shuffling all the points around, getting them so that they're close to their neighbors and far away from other points that they're dissimilar to. And then once it sort of settles down, it moves itself into this grid. And then this is me moving through that space and interpolating. Here we can just see the colors are interpolating. This is actually just uh, RGB color data. But you can see that the interpolation is sort of taking on the neighbors that it's close to and moving around in the space and getting a new color or a new vector that it's uh, you know, in that two-dimensional space. Ted, do you interpolate in the high dimensional space? So these are just markers? Uh, no. So, well, yeah. Um, OK, right. So what PA is asking, which is the next I'm going to show you in the, um, my demo, but is that, so what, what's happening here is I'm sort of moving around in this two dimensional space, but as it does the interpolation, it's interpolating between the higher dimensional space 
of these color values. So right, I'm like interpolating between this three three-dimensional point, this three-dimensional point, this three-dimensional point, this three-dimensional point, and taking the interpolation of the RGB values and then showing me that color, right? That's what you see, but in terms of under the hood, because when you do your greenification, you make an artificial proximity between the yellow and the pink dot, and we're not getting the original. So if, if you do your distance from the real distance or from the shrink greenified distance, when you query that. Sorry. Okay, okay um, so I'm going to show you this happen. So I have this uh, sound maker, which I think we, uh, yes. Okay, so this is the synth, right? And uh, here's all the sliders. And here are all those vectors, or all those parameters. And actually, I was saved two more to add so I could show you. Take this guy, slide it over here to params. Take this guy, slide it over here to params. That's how we add them, and now they should all be there. So what I could do is move around and find a sound I like, and then click Add. And now that's added. Um, oh, I forgot to do the, um, the audio bus. There, that's, now it says using audio descriptors. Add another, great. And then uh, I'm just gonna do some random points now so it's faster instead of finding a bunch of good ones, but. And when it adds it to the set, it takes the last half of a second of audio descriptors and finds the median value for all those um, descriptors. I don't know how many this is, but then if I click train, You'll run the algorithm, analyze the audio descriptor vectors, and organize them in two-dimensional space so that their neighbor relations are maintained. And then do the gridification. You can see it can be a little weird, like these guys had to move pretty far, but it's an optimal solution, so hopefully it's the least weird solution that is available. And then if I move to that space, I get all the sounds that were mapped there. Now, I think if this is what you were asking, so when it does these interpolations, it's not interpolating and giving me back the audio descriptor data, which is the data that it, was, that it used to organize this, right? It's giving me back the parameter vector data interpolated that created the sounds that gave me the audio descriptor data that it used. So it gives me the, audio, uh, the parameter values interpolated between these four different audio descriptor points. So now I have this two-dimensional space that's defined by these presets that I chose carefully, not, not carefully in this point, but <laughs> otherwise that I chose carefully. I wanted to have these you know, 12 or so um, points available to me. And now they're mapped into this lower dimensional space that I can move between. Um, I have, so this is sort of the like testing zone. I have over here sliders that'll do the same thing for me. And I can map those to a MIDI controller, X, Y, whatever, any input, in fact. I mean, the way the software is built, I can just sort of click that. It's like a MIDI learn situation, right? So I can easily map it to whatever I want. Um, another thing I can do is put an LFO on it, or an LFO on each of them. So now I'm using two LFOs to move through this space. And what's interesting about this is, I mean, the motion is obviously LFO noise motion, but ostensibly anywhere that it goes in this two-dimensional space, I've already decided it's a place that I like, right? So it'll move the interpolating between these different points, but it's not going to, if I just put LFOs on all the parameters individually, all 12 parameters, you know, it might end up in some corner of the 12-dimensional space that I don't want it to go to. This way I know that it's going to be places that I like. Right, so it's doing interpolation. Yeah, so when you do that interpolation, yeah. you are interpolating. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you could potentially, you don't know what's in between those. Yeah, but I like to think that the structure of the space is such that, um, you know, if there's like a, in, the, in this high dimensional space, if there's like a, a sort of structure that I like, it's going to be interpolated through that structure. You're always moving in between these points. 
Right, and it's not going to leap out to some corner of the space that I don't want it to be in. No, 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 of course. It's, I'm taking less chance. Yes, that's next. This isn't beautiful for you? I was just kidding. Uh, here's an example that is uh, pre-chosen more carefully. And this example, so this is actually, so th the reason I have this example here is because it actually is not using the audio descriptors because it involves stochastic elements. In particular, just a delay. It involves a delay that's a feedback delay. Uh, and it's like a five second, you know, modulating thing. So it could be, you know, depending on what came before it, I mean, it could have anything in the audio descriptors. So using the audio descriptors for this would be mean to the algorithm and also useless to me because it's really not going to give me what I think it is. Um, so in this space, this is again just two dimensions. We, I can, uh, yeah. So I have a granulator, uh, this like uh, uh, frequency modulation sort of processor, uh, the pitch shift delay, distortion, amplitude modulation, and a chorus. That's my little signal path, my synth that I've built here. And allows me to move through all that space. I'm moving continuously through this two-dimensional space, interpolating between the neighbors that are presets. Yeah. yeah. And um, one nice thing about this, too, is I actually have some uh, toggles. So they're not all just handles. They also can be just toggles like bypass switches that turn a processor on or off. And that is baked into the algorithm too. It just is a one or a zero when it does the training. So, um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's another. I'll put this into, I haven't tried it with this one, but it should work fine. If uh, I put it into uh, a different dimensional space, so like a four dimensional space. It, oh, no. Should it, I tried it on the last one. You were just so excited to see the thing. I should have done it with that. It's okay. So, it's fine. Um, okay. So this is the instrument. And like I said, it has the sort of two-dimensional space. I can also put it in three or four-dimensional space. When it goes up to there, it either does the gridification like this or it does uh, k-nearest neighbor regression on the three nearest neighbors in the four-dimensional space, which is only because in four dimensions, your corner system is going to require more data points. And so if I don't have enough data points, it isn't really going to work. We're going to have these sort of empty pockets. So, um, but it sort of calculates, like, oh, should I use the grid or should I use something else? And then it will do that. Um, OK. So I think, is there anything else I wanted to, yeah. Oh, the only other sort of design feature I wanted to show was that, um, Yeah, totally broke it. I'm gonna I'm gonna boot it back up. You said like your gestures when you're moving through, like say these like parameter locked mm -hmm. presets. Can you also record like say you like the path, a follow path that created with this mm -hmm. sequence through that data? Can you record that and then play through a sequence of like you know say like you wanted to play a performance through eight or nine different? Yeah. yeah. And the sequence that order in a way, kind of like parameter lock. I don't have that, but I love that idea. That would be great. Cool. And that would be to create company, it could be like, yeah, taking your presets and the performances of your presets and then sequencing the order of those mm -hmm. on your seconds I can see that being really Oh the, oh the presets. Um, well you know, you were just doing it manually yeah. with like a controller, but like recording that data and then having that being able to sequence the order of all that composed with that. Yes. No, I don't. I can't sequence the control information. You can't do that yet. Not yet, but that would be great. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I can save multiple. Uh, right now, it's just sort of a function of how I designed it. But I can have like if I have a two-dimensional space and a four-dimensional space, I can flip back and forth between those really easily. 
So I could have a two-dimensional XY that I'm moving between and then hop over to the QNEO and be in like a four-dimensional space, all in the same set of parameters. Did you check. have some cool sweet spots in there, which is yeah. like, if you could replicate that again yeah, totally. and then store that yeah. and be able to see it to different orders of different yeah. tasks. Yeah. Or if you could do a program or something that I really like to do the thing I showed earlier, you could record the control pack and change the weight of how you integrate the control pack. So yeah. you have all the same gesture, but yeah. you overweight or underweight different parameters, and suddenly you have variations if you can do just a bit of so the only other f design feature that I was going to show you with this is that, so I have these two sliders that move me, oh no, yeah, I'm all off plan. Um, so I have these two sliders. <laughs> that let me move through that two-dimensional space, just x, y, and then I have a s another set of sliders that do the exact same thing, so I've just replicated them, but what I found is that it's really useful to have multiple modes of control on the same space, so what I've really liked doing is putting two of them on an LFO, so that they're moving freely through the space, but I can control the rate of the LFO, so if I like something, I can sort of bring the rate down really low, and it'll meander slowly, and then also I have it hooked up to the QNEO on just a pad XY, so I can also be gesturally jumping through that space. It sort of becomes a battle between me and the LFOs about where I am and what I want to hear, and if I leave that, it, it's not silent, it actually keeps moving, and so that's part of one of the, one of the um, features that I've recently added and think is working well. Uh, okay. Really want to do this. Um, yeah, so we covered this, we covered this. Uh, I'm moving a little bit more quickly. I showed you demo two per Alex's request. So some, some benefits of this approach that I'm finding is that it preserves my user-defined points that I like. So when I find those, those are central in the, the instrument, right? So those aren't getting lost. That data isn't sort of getting mangled in some way through, you know, neural networks or something where it's, you know, close but not there. I ha exa have exactly those. Uh, TSNE is quite good at what it does. Monkrace is an optimal algorithm, so it's going to be quite good at what it does. Um, and this sort of latent space, the two-dimensional or, or four-dimensional or whatever, I usually end up in those two numbers, but the, the lower dimensional space that I'm using, I don't know where the sounds are, right? So I really have to learn that space. I have to explore it and play with it, fight against the LFO and figure out what are the gestures, what are the things that I like. And I really like this because it means that I have to learn the instrument. And for me, that learning process, you know, we've been sort of talking about this, but that learning process is what uh, leads to musical expression and leads to me really knowing what the options are and how to move between it. And so the learning is important, the practicing, practicing is important, and the fact that the instrument is set up, set up this way, it requires me to do that. So I necessarily will do that. I can't just sort of make it and then think I know what's going on. Um, some rejected alternatives. So quickly, I started out thinking that this was going to be a neural network, but I quickly realized that I didn't want to have to decide you know, where the sounds would be beforehand. Um, I didn't want to say, well, this sound sounds like it's up here, this one sounds like it's down there. Uh, this sort of d makes those decisions for me in an intelligent way that then is an instrument that I can learn. And also, they tend to need a lot more data. And here I'm working with eight, 15 data points. So training a neural network on that seems like a sort of not, not a great solution. Um, can I move in this high dimensional space quickly? Yes. Interpolated, yes. Gestural, yes. The, um, the thing I'm still trying to figure out is how is it musical? Do I feel musically expressive using it? Do I feel as musically expressive using it as before I was using it? Right? So I've been playing for a while. Does it feel that musical to me? Uh, I think we're getting there. I think I just need to practice more. I think I just need more time with it. So we'll get there. Um, some reflections on that question of musicality. 
So I'm sort of taking this from Thor Magnuson's ICLI paper from last year. He talks about these three um, modes of control. And the first one doesn't apply to electronic music. Um, and, but the second two, he relates the first one, indexical control, to something like a filter cutoff knob, where a knob moves from low to high, and the filter moves from low to high. So it's a map, very clear. Symbolic control, he says the mapping is arbitrary, uh, and this is really what I'm getting in the latent space. You know, left to right, up to down. There's, there's no you're really mapped control there, so I really have to learn the space. Um, so this is the strategy I'm now in in the latent space. And what I'm finding is that I really can't get into the flow of improvisation when I'm in this new space where things aren't mapped. But I really do think that it's just a matter of practice again. Like if I practice with the instrument, I will learn the space and I'll be able to get back into that flow state. Uh, skip, skip. Okay, <coughs> one more thing to show you. And um, so as I was building this sort of machine learning uh, synthesis parameters and audio descriptor model, I realized what I should probably do is find all of the synthesis parameters that I can in a uniform distribution of the parameter space, find the audio descriptors for that parameter space, and then train a neural network to learn to predict the synthesis parameters given the audio descriptors. I have another graphic that um, is useful for this. I'm going to skip this one. So what I do is, I take um, this Poisson disk sampling. It's basically a way to get uniform distribution in a large dimensional space. Get a couple thousand data points. Use those to drive the synthesizer. Take the audio, get the audio descriptors. And then once I have the synthesis parameters and the audio descriptors that are paired, I use a neural network that learns to predict what the synthesis parameters were when I show it the audio descriptors. That's an expensive speaker. Um, so I show it audio descriptors, and it learns to predict the synthesis parameters that created those audio descriptors. Then once I have that neural network trained, I can show it any live audio. <laughs> and it will take that audio and predict, as well as it can, what synthesis parameters would be used to create that audio. And then I can use those synthesis parameters to drive the synthesizer and produce an output. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to show you that. So here's the, um, the synthesizer. It's like a granulator of FM, some, mod, some uh, processing. And if I play this, one of these sounds, and then turn on the predictor, it starts driving all these. So what you're hearing is the bassoon, that's the live audio, and then the synthesized sound is the sort of the best, the neural network's best attempt at recreating that sound with these synthesis parameters. So is it perfect? I mean, no, but it, right, as a processing effect, it's close enough that I think we perceive it as being a processing effect. It takes a live input, distorts it in some way, and returns it. Um, and so now the next step, I think, for this section is to be, have it in a some dimensional space that I can flip between letting the acoustic improviser alongside of me drive the synthesis parameters, then I can flip back and I can drive the parameters, and I can let the LFO drive the parameters, and all this stuff, and see if I can find a really nice sort of flow in that moving in this high dimensional space with all of those control inputs. <laughs> 